The Singleton pattern. Love it? Hate it? Somewhere in between? Either way, you should know about it. What? It's Halloween. Have a little fun. Hey everybody, uh, Kevin back here with you in the code and today we're going to learn the singleton pattern. Remember the singleton patterns kind of got some goods, kind of got some bad to it, but uh, in order for you to decide if it's right for you, how about we just learn what it is. So uh, we have a simple console app here already started and we have nothing in it and it uh, doesn't, it won't do anything until we give it some functionality. So first thing we're going to do is just save ourselves a little bit of effort here by doing a console read key. So the, uh, the console doesn't just immediately close. And then um, the singleton is a uh, single instance of a class. So first thing we're going to need is we're going to need a class. And I'm going to create a class over here. And for now, we're just going to call this my class. And all you get there is public my class. And if you come back here and you save our, uh, all right, we can name this uh, our class, even though it's my class, new my class. And you know what? Technically, you have a singleton. You have one single instance of a class. And there you go. That was the singleton pattern. Actually, not so easy because you have no way to enforce that only one of these will ever be created. And that's where the name singleton comes from. So what we can do is we can go in here and say, you know what? Um, let's make the constructor on this guy private. And when I do so, and I come back here, I can no longer actually create that. And now naturally you're gonna say, well, what's the point of that? Now I can't even create one. So I'm back to zero instances of my class. And you'd be right. So what we need to do is create or invoke the private constructor. So let's, uh, let's add a little bit of uh, plumbing here. So we're gonna do private static, and we're gonna do my class. That's right, we're gonna have a my class inside a my class and we'll call this uh, instance. And if we come down here, we could actually do instance uh, equals new my class. And there you go. Um, now you have uh, a problem <laughs> because now it's recursive. So uh, what we actually need to do is bust this out into a static variable here. So we're gonna do a public static, and this is gonna be a getter. So we're gonna return a my class. Uh, and we're going to call it instance. And let's do a get, and we're going to do if instance is null, we can say uh, instance equals new my class, and then we can just return the instance. And now when we go out to my program, we still can't do it like that, but what we can do is we can do my class dot, let's see, Oops. Whoops, let's uh, fix a couple things here. So uh, first of all, again, I can't spell if you know that about me. And this actually needs to be static real quick. So let's pop back here. So now we can do my class dot instance. And sure enough, if we were to check the runtime value of our class, we would have a an instance. This would not be null. So, um, OK. So let's just review real quick. We made our singleton, our real singleton, by saying, okay, you're private, and you can only create it through this uh, property mem member here, which is static, and if, it's, if the private instance is null, go ahead and create a new one. So let's add some functionality real quick, and we'll do that by adding an instance member, so non-static at this part uh, point, and we can call this maybe the name field, so a getter and a setter. So if we jump back here, we can say our class dot name, and there we go. We can, let's call it, uh, ooh, I don't know, uh, Fred. Fred's a good name. And there you go. So you have a now a way to enforce that you have one and only one our class and you can start setting your properties. So the net effect is here that the my class that instance now holds global state and that uh, single property that it has is Fred. But remember how I said we only need one and only one. This will work in a single threaded environment, no problem. 
However, in a multi-threaded environment, such as a web context, which is probably a, a very common uh, use case for you, this is not thread safe. The reason is it's possible that more than one thread could call myclass.instance at, at similar times and get in here more than once. Now, you'll still only have one instance, but you'll keep running through this right here because once you set Fred on there and the second, th oh, from the program, and the second thread comes through here, it'll reinitialize here and probably blow out the value of name. So, actually, unless you know you're going to be in a single thread environment, you don't want to do this. This is not uh, thread safe. So, let's create a thread safe version of the singleton. So, to do so, we're going to create a new class just to keep things clear. And we're going to call this thread safe singleton just to make it darn obvious that this one is... Uh, you know, thread safe. So it's going to have some similar plumbing. We're going to have a uh, private instance member here, and it needs to be static. And let's see, let's call this just simply instance. And by the way, that's kind of the traditional naming to call a singleton is um, is through is to call it an instance. So we're going to need that private constructor again. So far, everything looks totally like what you're used to. We're going to use or used to as of two minutes ago. Uh, we're going to do a public static getter and we're going to call it instance. Of course, you could call this whatever you want. And if I put what I return, that would be nicer. And here's my getter. In fact, you're going to see a lot of things that are very similar to what you just saw. So if uh, instance equals null, instance equals new thread safe singleton, and then we're going to return the instance. Okay, so far this looks exactly like the other one. So what gives, Kevin? So what you need to do is do some sort of locking in your class. And let's create a private static variable. Again, um, let's make it read only. You don't have to, but you know, ReSharper will suggest that if you don't. We just need any old object. This is the way threading works. Not really the scope of uh, the discussion today of, of threading and, and locks and stuff like that. But we're going to put in a lock here. And I'm just going to call it padlock. Oh my gosh, I can't spell. It's when your fingers get off by one key. Oh my gosh. Uh, find the home row here. Okay. All right, there it is. Uh, padlock equals new object. Um, you could use probably something else, but the point is, is you can use any objects, and so there you go. And uh, we're going to come down here, and today you're getting two patterns for the price of one, because what we're going to be doing here is the double check lock. So first thing we do is if uh, instance is null, and you may be thinking, um, Kevin, we already did that on the line below. And yes, you are correct. We did. Oops, we're going to do here. So you're going to actually check for the instance twice. However, in between these, you're going to actually lock the padlock. And uh, I will have to explain some of the details with threading and locking, but uh, there you go. So, so far, so good. Actually, so far, so great. Because what's going to happen here is you're going to have more than one thread possibly get in here, just like the other one. And so we're going to do, uh, the, let's say the first thread gets here. So if instance is null, yep, it's null first time around. I need you to lock the door so no other threads can come in. And that's what that lock keyword's going to do. And then I got to check again. Okay, just, just be clear, it still is null, right? And if we pass that, we're going to go ahead and create a new instance of the, of the singleton. If you fail that, we're going to unlock the door because we're going to get out of that scope lock and we're going to return whatever. So now the second time through, the uh, instance or this, yeah, the instance should be not null and actually it will short circuit right to here. So um, to recap what locking does, let's say you have 10 different um, threads come in and they're all in there at the same time. The first one is responsible for getting in here, locking the door and instantiating this thread safe singleton or in this case, just the singleton. And uh, when uh, the second through 10 threads get here, they will all queue up. Nobody's allowed in here. Now, this creates a bottleneck 
at the beginning. So if this is very expensive to create, you're gonna you're gonna slow up your system, but it's only momentary or well, however long it takes to create this first one, because um, what will happen is threads two through ten will all pass this instance is null check. That's why we want to come here and lock the door. Once we unlock the door from that first thread, they're actually going to hit this block right here. That's why we're checking the second time whether or not the instance is null. So this uh, singleton does nothing yet. So let's add some uh, stuff here, and we'll just return that same thing, maybe a getter setter. Um, you can return maybe if you're working with a uh, something that has nodes, like a node ID, etc. And there you go. And so when you instantiate this first time, you might want to set a default value such as, hey, you know what? Instance.name equals, oops, Kevin. So notice here, uh, these are our uh, instance members. They are not static. That's why if you just try to do something like name, it won't work. Um, if you try to do this.name, uh, it also won't work. So what you're going to do is you're going to do that instance dot name. So uh, just so you know, uh, just a little side thing here. Uh, no, pun, actually, pun totally intended because uh, global state can have side effects. Meaning, when I'm in my program here, anybody gets to change the properties here, and that's called a side effect because changing something outside of your scope causes side effects. So. Um, the unit testing crowd will cry foul with singletons often because when they're trying to isolate problems, global state, statics, singletons, they all give trouble potentially. In my experience, sometimes they are worth the trouble because sometimes, yes, I want global state. I want to keep track of something application-wide. So that's a debate for uh, another uh, medium, but not today. So uh, let's, let's do our thread safe singleton equals... Uh, thread safe singleton that instance, and then we can also do the similar things here. And again, I'm not going to set up threading um, to to let you know that yes, this indeed works in a thread safe environment. But uh, trust me, I've used this pattern often, and it works just great. Um, I would recommend almost never using the non-thread safe uh, portions here. Um, you don't ever know when your, your library might be used in a single thread environment or a multi-thread environment. There's not much effort here to make it uh, multi-thread friendly. So uh, I would recommend you always go this route. Now, one other advantage that you're going to find with uh, singletons versus, say, just using static, because the, uh, the uh, acute or the, uh, the keen observer may notice that, well, why don't you just use a, a static variable and then you're good there. Well, one great reason why you don't do that is because on a static variable, you can't use extension methods where you could add an extension method to a uh, thread safe singleton. So let's say you had you implemented a, uh, a quick extension, you could just do dot whatever right here. If it were a static variable, um, for instance, then that wouldn't work and you wouldn't be able to extend it very well. So um, that is uh, Singleton in just a few uh, short minutes here and um, good luck and you don't have to use it, but it's good to know what it is and to know that there are some pros and cons with it. And I hope you learned something. Thanks. Bye.